Welcome back. Let's turn now to an actor who's been heralded as one of the greatest stage actresses of her generation and described as a tidal wave of unsystematically creative thought, which we're going to find out about as well as we listen to her in a moment. Internationally, she's best known for her role as awful Aunt Petunia in the Harry Potter film series and as a witch in the HBO series True Blood. But she's also an award-winning classical actress and she's joining me now because it's the moment when we talk about her latest project, directing, directing Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro here in London. Well, that's just a glimpse of your <laughs> life and your, and your thoughts and so on and so forth. Uh, was this always your favourite piece of... Uh, Opera music? Or? Well, it's very like Shakespeare, Mozart. You know, it's very tight and frame. Everybody knows the tunes, but they don't quite know where they're from. And right. really, to direct an opera is to thread together these huge arias, which are in fact just speeches to the world about the inner state of those characters. And then you put them, thread them through the day of, of, of Figaro's marriage. And it's a, it's a very interesting fact that when you take a very ordinary day in someone's life and you really scrutinise it, how interesting everybody's life is. Yeah. And so, and so that's a particular skill of Mozart. Yeah? Uh, well, Mozart has a, you know, the, fr the, the music is, is, is unnegotiable. You know, it is absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. It's impossible to sing. So very few people can, in the Countess is a very, very difficult role to sing. And so is Carabino, the famous young boy who, who dresses, who's a, a girl dresses as a boy, dresses as a girl. And these are incredibly high and they're incredibly demanding. And the duets are amazing. But the most phenomenal thing about Mozart is that he wrote these sextets and even octets where you have six people singing their thoughts at the same time, all in contradiction. And it sounds beautiful, but in fact, in speech, it would sound like a cacophony. So is it much, much more difficult, therefore, to direct an opera, and more difficult than directing a play? Um, it's There's much more, more difficult on one hand in that, in that you have this multifarious realities going on at, at any one time. It's easier in that the rhythm of the evening is held by the conductor, not by the performer. Whereas in the theatre, it's the actor. If, if you've got a slow Hamlet, you've got a long evening. Yeah. But oh, in God, the opera, yeah. you absolutely have it held by the music. So it's, it's, it's in that way a better frame. You ended up also having a great success in the Harry Potter films. How did that come about? Well, I was performing Medea, of all things, I think, in, um, in Dublin. And a phone call came, and uh, on the, I was asked, would I be seen for the Harry Potter films? I had, in fact, read them to a young child that, 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 that summer. I, uh, I saw, you, you did I was a Stephen vaguely Fry, familiar. because he did, read them too. Didn't yeah, you? and I was vaguely familiar with, with, uh, with the first, certainly with the first book, which I think is all we knew at the time. And I was delighted and slightly appalled to be cast in Harry Potter because, of course, I really wanted to play something magical. And uh, Mrs. Mrs. Dursley is, is a muggle and therefore has no magical powers. And um, I remember feeling really galled about that. But, of course, it's a huge privilege to be part of that global series. You become a... A living legend by being in uh, Harry you Potter. You become an amazing intrusion into children's minds, don't you? Because they have, you know, when you read a book, you can make up your own picture of what people look like. But the Harry Potter film series has been so popular that all those characters in the books really now have actors' uh, faces applied to them. Yes. And uh, I hope it's a good thing. Yes. And you are Aunt Petunia. I am. To children and grown-ups all over the world. People are very frightened of me. Yes, I mean, children are often frightened when they meet me. It's quite, it, oh, it, it's quite a... A burden. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and did you get a completely different sort of fan reaction from all ages, or mainly young people, children? Well, it's. Uh, I mean, it's. A, it's a, the, the phenomenon of these franchise films is that parents and children watch them together, and they watch them more than once. I had had a similar experience on a film called Three Men and a Little Lady some decade earlier, where people have watched the film four or five times because they go to children's parties or they have them as you know, birthday treats. So they all know the films off by heart. So uh, it's very funny when I get off the aeroplane to somewhere like LAX and LA, but both adults and children, they all seem to, to cringe and run. Oh, really? But oh, I'm yeah. quite harmless. So you, you, you have <laughs> a very, very pleasant walk out. <laughs> yes, not, I do. Not troubled by anybody as you <laughs> yes. stroll towards, yes. stroll towards yeah. the plane. And so over the years now, are we going to be seeing more of you, uh, well, as a director, I suppose you don't see you as a director backstage, but... You know what I mean. Uh, but are we going to see more of you as a director of plays, a director of opera, an actress, 
classical actress or a film actress? Well, my main job is really classical acting or doing plays that, that take a huge amount of energy and time. And, you know, I, I did Mother Courage 18 months ago. I did John Gabriel Boatman last year in New York with Alan Rickman. And I've just done uh, London Assurance with Simon Russell Beale. They take so much of your life up um, that I don't want to become somebody who spends every night of my life performing in the theatre because I think I'll have less and less to offer. So the opera or directing is just an opportunity to to have a busman's holiday, really, to at least not be actually performing, but to be in the world that I love being in and uh, having another creative input into it. Well, and don't, don't for goodness sake, lose, with all these different roles, lose that Irish accent, which no. is absolutely <laughs> delightful. Well, I have to sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Sarah. you very much. Great to have you with us. Lovely to be here. Scientists in Minnesota claim they have come one step closer to combating the ageing process by conducting experiments on mice and purging these mice of old zombie cells that no longer work, they have been able to slow the process of ageing and they may be able to do more. So, can these scientists apply their techniques to human beings? If so, how long will that take? Could we live forever? Joining me now from Minnesota is the lead scientist from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Jan van Dursen. Jan, thank you very much for joining us, of course. And how would you summarize what you've discovered so far? How would you summarize, it's not the elixir of life, but it can have a profound effect on life? Yes, so the discovery is that as we age, we accumulate cells in our bodies called senescent cells. And those cells really um, seem to accumulate as a defense against cancer. But once they are there, they seem to be not innocent bystanders, but they seem to um, contribute to the dysfunction of our organs and tissues. And so what we hypothesized is if you were to remove those cells, would you be able to slow down certain uh, age-related pathologies, diseases, and um, could you do it safely? So can you remove them without having any adverse negative consequences? And to our surprise, um, when we designed um, a mouse model to test this, um, we found that uh, the removal of these uh, senescent cells through a genetic trick in this case um, had only uh, positive consequences. It slowed down um, dramatically the development of age-related um, disorders and diseases. Um, it did not reverse them, however. And, uh, but in that case, when you remove the senescent or sometimes called zombie cells, when you remove those cells and then you look at the results, do you replace the cells that you've taken out by putting in others, or do you just proceed with the, the cells that are left in the body? That's a good question. We don't really have an answer to that, but what um, we do know is that senescent cells are few in number. It's not like the majority of cells as we age will be senescent cells. They're a small group of cells that reside in our tissues or organ or organs, um, but their consequences are very broad. These are cells that secrete um, a lot of factors, compounds, uh, into their cellular environment to, their, that, to which their neighboring cells uh, are negatively impacted. So it's like having, um, you know, one bad apple in, in yeah. a basket. I see. So, so that and that effect is removed when you remove the senescent cells. And so, if you, yeah. So, when you remove the senescent cells, you're actually removing very few cells, and um, it's not that important, I think, personally, that those cells be replaced because you lose very few cells. Right. But what you really do, I think, is la make the cells that were negatively impacted, the healthy cells that were negatively impacted by these senescent cells, make them function better again. 
and you you think they definitely do recover in that circumstance when the senescent cells are removed the adjacent cells improve yes so we actually did two different types of experiments we removed senescent cells basically from a very young age to a late age and we saw if you continuously remove senescent cells you have the biggest impact then you get a very very strong delay of age-related phenotypes in our model if you did the second experiment we did was um, remove senescent cells from a mouse that already was uh, very advanced in the aging process and mm -hmm. what we then saw is when you remove the senescent cells that from that point on the progression of aging was delayed but we did not see that the old mouse became um, had all the properties of a very young mouse could could these discoveries lead to improving uh, people's old age people who need this treatment improving their old age or extending their old age uh, interestingly when um, scientists that looked at centenarians so those are people that live a uh, hundred plus years typically they have a very long health span they don't they, are, they don't become sick seriously sick until the last months or at most years several years of their life um, whereas the non-centenarians have a much longer period towards the end of their lives where there is a lot of age-related decline going on and therefore a lot of um, medication and hospital visits and support and, um, and, and so forth is necessary. You lose your independence and you lose your quality of life. So what we hope in, uh, in first instance to accomplish is that perhaps the quality of life of elderly people will, uh, will be enhanced. The interesting observation is that um, chronic age-related diseases with the removal of senescent cells may be able, we may be able to treat them as a group rather than as an individual uh, disease. So instead of having medication for heart disease, for brain function, for uh, muscle function, maybe the clearance of senescent cells will improve all these functions and that would really improve health span we think. You mean that even if the person was suddenly able to live to be 150 and so on that he could still have a good quality of life right up to the age of 150? That would be the intent because I don't um, people uh, would not choose to live very long lives if uh, the last period of their life would be extended um, and w would be uh, a period where they would experience a lot of pain, discomfort and uh, um, dependence on other people. I think people would want to live long, healthy lives. In the longer term, therefore, is there any limit on that? I mean, theoretically, as the science progresses, could well, Could people we, live for 500 years? Well, I don't know. Um, probably, <laughs> probably not, I would say, as a scientist. What I do, uh, the numbers that I've heard is that the children that are born today um, have a good chance of living up to 100 plus years. That is just if you project the extension of yes. lifespan um, that we currently know. With a treatment like this, um, the expectation would be that several more years would be added to that lifespan if it really works. And so um, I think 500 years is, is, is not like um, in the immediate future, but um, the projections, the realistic projections are that people are going to live longer and that with these types of treatments, if they would really work, that they could live um, substantially be beyond the current projections. Well, that's really a fascinating glimpse of the future, Jan. Maybe we'll uh, 
continuing this conversation in a hundred years time who knows but uh, anyway thank you very much indeed we appreciate it far from something conjured out of storybooks pirates are now a scourge of the modern world as growing numbers of tourists are kidnapped and held hostage by Somali pirates. The nightmare became a reality for one British couple, Paul and Rachel Chandler, who survived a 13-month ordeal at the hands of Somali gangsters. Well, now they've uh, written a book about their experiences, and they join me here in the studio right now to tell their remarkable tale. And this weekend, it's a remarkable weekend, because I gather this weekend is... Remembrance Sunday. Yes, In and more ways than one for us. In more ways than one for you, because... It's the anniversary of our release. Exactly this weekend. Yes, exactly. that was really... Yeah. And you'd been promised the release lots of times. In ten days' time, yes. you'll be released or whatever, and it never happened. When did you really know this was it? This was real and you were going to be free? We were released on a Sunday, and it was on the Friday afternoon, that the leader of the gang, the bully Buggers, sidled up to us when there were no other gangsters around and said, my family give money, you go London, three days, four days, week. And then he slunk off and there was something in his demeanour, in his body language that gave us hope. But we didn't raise our hopes too high because they'd been dashed so often. Dashed so, so often. And the, uh, and, I mean, and the ransom that they'd been paid was what, £625,000 or something? No, as far as we know, it was nothing like that. Um, $440,000, what's that, about £300,000, was paid by our family in June. And then we don't know how much, if any, was paid at the end. Uh, Buggers said to us $200,000, again, uh, less than, what's that, £150,000, yeah. roughly. But, but um, and, and that money, that money um, a lot of it was donated by Somalis in this country, wasn't it? We have no idea really where that, that final payment came from. Uh, media have speculated on, on the obvious sources, one of which is the Somali diaspora, yeah. and the other is the, the TFG in Somalia, but we don't know. And this was 13, 13 months, uh, uh, the release 13 months after yeah. you, you were taken, captured or whatever. What was the first moment when you your heart sank and you realised you were being captured? I think it was after perhaps a couple of days on board because the pirates were on board Lynn Rival, our yacht, for six days before we reached Somalia. And they had had, the Bugus had had various phone calls on our satellite phone with his pirate mates. And at one point he said, you British big money, four million dollars. And I said, you know, small ship, no money, you know, retired people. But he, he, w he seemed so resolutely determined. And it began to sink in that we were going to have difficulty persuading them that, that we weren't worth kidnapping. Uh, they, they seemed absolutely determined by that stage that they were going to, to take us. And, and how many of the, of the 13 months, how much of it were you in solitary captivity as it were? Well two periods, we were first separated for a period of ten days uh, and that was on the pretext that they were frightened of being attacked by military forces and then we were reunited uh, for a very short period over Christmas and then we were separated again violently and kept apart for three months. And was it spectacularly worse when you were in, in solitary as it were? Oh absolutely, um, before then we'd been managing quite well, persuading one another that we'd soon be released, something would be sorted. Once we were separated, I knew that they, for, especially for the second time, I realised that they were determined to hold on to us, to hold out their hope of raising millions of dollars for us. And I could see no end to it. No. Why should anybody pay to millions no. of dollars for a retired couple? And you were tempted by the thought of suicide at one stage. I was. I was so angry at times and frustrated with the situation we were in. The fact that these these men thought they were invincible. Right. Um, they really were so 
smugly determined that it was going to make millions of dollars for out of us. And I just, I just really, I wanted out. And there was no way I could see of getting out apart from suicide. Mm. But I never went there. I mean, I, I think that inside me, deep inside me, I'm just not capable of committing suicide. I can see. You're, not, you're not suicide material, as they say. Yes, I absolutely. Think so. And Paul, how obviously they were your captors and so on, so they weren't doing you any favours, obviously. But I mean, they, they do say normally that the Somali pirates treat their captives well, as it were. Would you say you were treated well? Yes, in the sense that they were concerned to maintain the value of their asset. And uh, particularly since they were holding us as kidnap rather than as, in a sense, the human shields that they hold most of the seafarers for because they're selling the ships and cargoes back to their owners. So it was vitally important for them to keep us alive. And to that extent, they provided us with food and water and limited shelter and if they had medicines that we needed, uh, again, they would provide them. They wanted to keep us in good health. Mm. There was no malice from them, generally. No malice, Apart generally. from the leader. Did, did the leader was malicious, was he? Well, he, he was a big bully, a nasty, na traditional nasty piece of work. And he, he was nasty. Did they, some accounts say that they, did they beat you at times or not? Yes, we were beaten when we were separated for the second time. And that was Bugus's reaction to us saying, no, we won't, we don't want, we won't go voluntarily. Mm. We wanted to demonstrate at that point that this was something that was very painful to us and that, that they were being cruel to us. And we hoped that some of the gangsters at least would feel some compassion towards us. But Bugus's reaction was to fire shots at us, to whip us and, um, in fact, I, I was beaten with a, the butt of a rifle, and which knocked a tooth out, which I've now had repaired. <laughs> One of the advantages of being back in India. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, so Sunday is the exact uh, anniversary. How are you going to spend the day? Well, I think we'll, we'll have a leisurely breakfast, and then we'll make our way over the ferry in Dartmouth and up to the boatyard where our yacht, Lynn Rival, is sitting on the hard. And we'll get down to work. We're same, the same yacht, same, same yacht. yacht. She was and, uh, brought home and by the Navy. Is, this whole experience hasn't put you off the thrill of sailing. No, absolutely not. Uh, it's both the thrill of sailing and the love of travelling, and that was what we were doing yeah, before yeah. we were captured. And we still want to travel. We love to travel, and it hasn't put us off now. Mm. And did you see anything while you were there and, that would help? I mean. That, something that they ought to do to try and deal with the piracy problem or is it insoluble? No, it's certainly soluble. We saw a bit about Somalia, learnt about their culture and we've learnt a lot more since we came back and obviously the, the problems of Somalia have to be sorted but I think the problem of piracy has to be sorted out separately because the trading nations of the world and particularly the East African countries which are very hard hit now can't wait for the one or two generations it may take to stabilize Somalia. But they haven't got, the International Act hasn't been no. gotten together, has That's it? That's correct. So. Well, anyway, thank you very much for being here. An upbeat moment, one, every day is an upbeat moment yes, since that so, experience. Yeah. Everyday freedom. Yeah. 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 And uh, everyday freedom, yes. Uh, my thanks to all of my guests. Uh, do join me again in seven days' time for another Frost Over the World.